Good evening, class. Professor J.J. Debras here. Uh, again, just want to welcome you guys back. Second week of class. We'll be talking about chapters two and three tonight. A little bit of housekeeping. I understand that some of you had trouble with the link uh, for uh, the lecture. So, um, again, please continue to email me. It sounds like your classmates were able to get you the link uh, for those of you who had trouble. Uh, but again, I'll make sure that this, the, the link does indeed work. I also understand in some cases it looks like on my YouTube that um, my voice is not matching up to uh, the picture. So I'm trying to work on the audio and the visual to get them synced together. I hope to have that uh, done by next week, unfortunately. So um, again, in worst case scenario, turn off the picture, listen to the video, and you should be okay to go. So thank you guys for getting your discussions in. My hope is to have those graded by uh, later on this week. And uh, that'll have us wrapped up for last week. So we're into chapters two and three. Chapter two, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, developing our marketing plan. So, and the book is going to uh, is very clear about talking about the difference between marketing and sales. And so, what what I usually kind of address is marketing is kind of our game plan. It's our strategy. It's kind of the, the big picture thinking, if you will. Where sales is more of the action steps we're going to take to enact our marketing plan. So that's kind of what um, the book addresses, how we're going to look at it as two separate things. A lot of times they do get lumped into each other. You will see a lot of overlaps where one affects the other or one is going to direct the other. But again, they are absolutely two separate things. Um, again, importance of marketing. Obviously, we have to have a plan. We have to have a strategy as we begin to attack our markets. doesn't matter if you have the corporate market. doesn't matter if you have um, Smurf, conventions, um, associations, what have you. So again, we want to have in place what our plan is going to be. So, um, and again, as we do this, there is, when we put together our marketing plan, we talk about the four Ps, uh, product, place, promotion, price. Most of these are very uh, easily explainable. Product, the actual physical, tangible, or intangible aspects of what we're selling. In our case, it's usually meeting space, uh, some sort of catering service, and overnight rooms. Those are our products, if you will. The place. How accessible the hospitality product is to our market. So again, we talk about place. Uh, let's just again think of downtown Indianapolis. You're selling for the JW. You're selling for the downtown um, Omni. You're selling for the Crown Plaza downtown. Your place. Where are you physically located? What does that bring into the mix? Promotion, both persuasive and communication. How are we going to promote ourselves? Advertising, salespeople, getting on the phone, calling uh, potential clients. What are we saying? How are we pushing our our process what is the promotion of our product and finally price and obviously that's self-explanatory the price for meeting rooms the price for overnight rooms the price for our catering so those are your four P's as we start to look at things and as we put together our marketing plan um, basically we're gonna look at a number of different things um, we're gonna look at what affects us what, what we affect and how they all tie together so a lot of times when we put together our marketing plans um, you're looking, it can be as quick as 30 days. You know, what are we going to do for this month? This is a need month. We're going to attack this. Could be as long as, thir or as three years. And a lot of times when you're doing a big plan, a big overview plan, you're looking more in the long term, okay, how that's going to affect us. However, the one concern with the hospitality market is that it's ever changing. And so, um, you know, in a three year span, we can see a lot of ebbs and flows, a lot of ups and downs. So I think a lot of us typically will plan for a year. And again, that plan is going to change. I mean, as you guys develop in, into, into this industry, you'll realize there are certain seasons when hotels are, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. We've got hotels where in the cold weather months, January, February, March, we are trying to push occupancy as much as we can because there's fewer travelers, especially here in the Midwest. It's cold. You don't have much travel. We hit those summer months and we see our travelers take a, uh, go up the bell curve, if you will, and now we're pushing rate. Different strategies different way of doing it. Come back down again, November, December, where it gets cold again. So we'll, we'll talk about different plans for different seasons as well. Um, so again, when we look at our marketing plan, what are some of the steps we're going to go over? Well, the four steps the book talks about basically is your marketing research, selection of target markets and your positioning, establishing objectives and action plans, okay, action plans, see sales, and reviewing and monitoring the plan. So let's take each one individually. Conducting your market research. We have to know what we're up against, who we're selling against, what is our market, what are the things that um, are assets to us, what are things that are going to persuade people to go elsewhere. So when we look at our market, uh, it can be everything from our brand of hotel, our strength of our sales team, where we're located at, 
what amenities we have, are we tied to a convention center? There's a wide variety of research that we're going to do. What is, um, what's our uh, competition like? You know, are we smaller in comparison to them? Do we have more meeting space or less? Uh, is, the si or is the age of our hotel compared to our comp competition? Does that come into play? Location, okay? We talk about, you know, it's funny, when I worked at the Crown, we were literally two blocks from some of the biggest office complexes in downtown Indianapolis. But in between the office complex and our hotel, that two block span, there were five hotels. So my location, typically we'd say you're two blocks away, that's fairly close, but within those two blocks, you had to walk, walk past five other hotels. Not an, not an asset. I'm actually too far away, believe it or not. So again, we're gonna look at our, our, um, our market and we're gonna kind of see where, where our assets lie, where our strengths are, where our weaknesses are. After we've done all this, and again, you're gonna look at your competition, you're gonna look at yourself. You gotta do a hard look at yourself. You really gotta do a good self-analysis to find out what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, and you have to be real, okay? You can't fluff anything over. You gotta take a hard look at, again, what you have over the competition and where your weaknesses are. Once that kind of, kind of, you lay that all out in front of you, then you can start to put together your objectives and your action plans, and these are gonna be your objectives obviously are what our goals are, and our action plans are the steps that are gonna get us to our goals. Now those steps typically are kind of the marching orders for the sales team. How we're gonna attack certain things to reach those objectives. Is that, you know, again, how we do our promotions, how we do our sales calls, what is our pricing strategy, what markets are we gonna go after, what segmentations are important to us. All that comes out of that marketing kind of analysis, if you will, and it's gonna lead us to what um, our action plans are. And then lastly, you're gonna to to review and monitor this plan. As I said, this industry is ever changing. So, you know, we could have a great plan for two months and then we have it uh, in a situation like a 9-11. Um, you know, we're obviously, it's just absolutely, you know, besides being obviously historically tragic, um, for our particular industry, it almost, you know, killed the hospitality industry. You know, no one wanted to fly, no one wanted to travel. There were all kinds of concerns, obviously. So, you know, how does that affect us? We had the market crash in about 2008, 2009, where again, nobody traveled. Uh, spending for meetings was thought to be excessive, so nobody had meetings, and it just it changed the industry. So again, we had to adjust our marketing plans. Um, so again, it's gonna be ever-changing, but, but we do wanna roll out with our ideal plan, and we'll adjust according to what goes on. So again, we talked about that property analysis and the competition analysis, okay? Looking at ourselves, looking at what the competition has. And again, guys, you really gotta be real with yourselves. Real when looking at our, our competition, saying what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses? What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? How do we sell against them? How are people gonna sell against us and how are we gonna overcome them? So again, this kind of analysis is huge when setting up your marketing strategy. Um, and again, we, we talked about these other ones, selecting the target markets. Again, we talked about a market, so we did comp analysis or competition or self-analysis. Then the other type of analysis is your target, or I'm sorry, your market analysis. So we look at the market and we say, okay, where do we fit in? What's our niche? I'm downtown Indianapolis, I'm connected to the convention center, and I've got 55,000 square feet of meeting space. I'm a group hotel. That's my niche. That's probably where my strength lies. Association, corporate meetings, athletic events that are take over parts, parts of the city, uh, smurf functions, social functions, wedding. There's my, that's the area I'm working in. Transient business, probably not as important. I'm too far south per se. We talked about how, again, using the hotel as an example, Crown Plaza downtown, you're two blocks away from the major office complexes and there's too many hotels in between you. Yeah, you wanna get transient traffic, but it's not your, your number one segment. Your number one segment is groups. Now that might flip flop if you're a different hotel. We look at the Hilton Garden Inn on the circle and they're located where they're one of the only select service properties, well, there's like two or three in that area, but they're right on the circle. They're attached to one of the buildings actually. That is their bread and butter. They're probably doing very little group business and tons of transient business. So again, you look at the market, you look at yourself, your self-analysis, what are my assets? And then that's how you will plan out your positioning and where you're gonna be at. So, um, and again, like I said, part of that action plan are gonna be our steps. What are our sales processes gonna be? How are we gonna sell? Who are we gonna sell to? Again, you're the downtown Crown Plaza, you're not putting a lot of emphasis on transient market. You're gonna give it some love, but not a ton. Your focus is gonna be on group sales, going after the associations, working very closely with Visit Indy. There's part of your marketing plan. We're gonna work very tightly with those guys. 
we're not regionally based, we're globally based because every, you know, not everybody, sorry, a lot of groups are coming into Indianapolis. So I can't just focus on my backyard. I got to focus from a global standpoint. So again, all this goes into your plan. Now, one of the last steps obviously is budgeting. Some hotels are going to have money to send your sales team to conferences. We're going to talk about, we talked about this actually in the last chapter, your third party planners like Helms Briscoe and Conference Direct, they will do conferences where they're bringing their clientele and uh, hoteliers together and introducing everybody, right? Well, those are expensive. You're talking $4,500, $5,000 to send a sales manager that. Some hotels, drop in the bucket, we're going. Other hotels look at that and go, man, if I don't get something out of this huge, you know, return on investment, ROI, we can't send, excuse me, we can't send anybody. So again, your budgeting, where are you going to spend your dollars, advertising-wise, what kind of gifts do you want to give the clients that maybe you're trying to win over? Are you going to travel out to different headquarters? Okay, you know, maybe we want to work McDonald's and they're based out of Chicago. We want to send our salespeople up there to start trying to work that that market. Well, there's a cost to that. You know, if, if we're trying to get Nike in here, where Nike's in Oregon. So again, you got to kind of look through where we're going to spend our, our, our dollars, our, our marketing dollars, or our budget, if you will, and how does that return on investment affect where our goals are, where our objectives are. So, you know, the big thing is basically once you have this in place, then it's up to the director of sales, could be the general manager, to sit down with the sales team and walk them through this. This is your march, marching orders. These are your objectives for the year. This is where our focus should be. So again, everything ties into this plan and it's, it's really essential. Again, if you guys are running your sales team, if you're the DOS, director of sales, you need to have a clear cut vision, a clear cut plan on how you're going to get your team from step A to step Z, which should be the, you know, um, getting to the objective that you've set up. So that's kind of what chapter one talks about. Again, I'm trying to give you guys a quick synopsis, a few of the major points. Um, so that's chapter, I'm sorry, that's chapter two, excuse me, I think I said chapter one, developing your marketing plan. Again, very essential uh, as leaders in your sales teams, leaders in your sales office, in setting up really um, what your game plan is gonna be for, again, could be a month, could be a, could be a quarter, could be a certain season, it could be a year, it could be three years. So hang tight, guys, just a minute. We're going to flip over here to chapter three as I bring up a new page here. So bear with me. I'm going to take a quick drink. Okay, so chapter three. Now we're looking at organization or organizing our convention's um, sales team, if you will. So this is going to run through. This chapter is really kind of cool, especially if you've never been in a sales office. Kind of run you through what the structure is. Okay, and so, and this is going to vary greatly upon what kind of property you're with. Select service properties, sometimes they're called limited service properties. I think select sounds better, to be honest. Uh, typically smaller sales team. Could be one sales manager or one DOS. You're a one-man band, if you will. You go to your commission sales hotels, um, again, downtown Indianapolis, your JW Marriott's, your Crown Plaza's, your Hilton's, uh, your Hyatt's, your, uh, again, the Omni. You're going to have multiple sales managers within a sales team, as well as convention services managers, you could have catering sales managers, you could have a wedding uh, expert, if you will, and you're obviously gonna have administrative staff. So we're gonna go through this um, very quickly. Chapter three does a fantastic job of laying out the different positions that you'll see within um, your sales offices. But again, they're gonna vary depending upon the size of the office. So as we kind of walk through here, um, let's first, we're going to kind of start from the top and go to the bottom. Again, I just want to touch on every possible aspect you guys could have in the office. And again, for those of you who are brand new to hospitality sales, this is something you're just delving into. Some of this may sound a little bit mundane, a little bit common sense, but we're going to touch on it anyways. So obviously in a hotel structure, you're looking uh, from top to bottom. Your general manager is where you start out with. The general manager is responsible for the entire hotel. Everything from revenues coming in to expenses and costs going out. They will oversee the DOS in most cases, which means they do oversee the sales team to some regard. They're also overseeing operations. They're the ones that are going to balance both sides of the, uh, the spreadsheet, if you will, right? Revenues coming in, costs going out, where are we making um, profit for our owners? So the GM starts everything off. Then as you kind of go down, um, it, again, it, it, will, it will vary up among hotel, but a lot of times you'll have a revenue management, and this could be somebody on site, you could have a, um, uh, a, a company, a management company that offers that. So again, I think we've kind of talked briefly, I work for General Hotel Corporations, which is both manages and owns properties. So the Crown Plaza downtown is a perfect example. Their revenue management 
goes through General Hotel Corporations. We have an entire Department of Revenue Management. We have a revenue manager that's assigned to that hotel. That sales team, that DOS, uh, that general manager will work with that revenue manager when it comes to setting our price, um, oh man, everything from, from, from where our price is going to be set now to six months out to three months out. What do our discounts look like when we talk about third parties like uh, Travelocity um, and those type of sites? Where our group rate should be, how it takes away from our inventory, and how that affects what our rack rate will be. It's a variety of different things. They do a lot of number crunching. If you like the analytics and the, and the number side of things, revenue management is right for you. Uh, it's an amazing field, and it has really become very, very popular with hotels to really manage the ebb and flow of seasons and time periods for hotels. For the longest time, rates might have been set regardless of what was going on. It could have been a dead month, but we're still running that 149. And we probably should be running that 99. Same thing. It's final four week, and you could get $500 for a room, but people are still running the 149. Revenue management looks at history, looks at future, looks at current, and says, hey, our history says we can really charge a lot during this time period. Or, hey, we're going to be dead for this time period. We should lower our rate in, you know, in the hope of trying to snag more business. So revenue management, like I said, a very, very neat aspect of the hospitality industry. And again, for, the, for those guys of you who like numbers, it's a great place to go and still stay within our industry. Who else do we have? Well, on the sales and marketing staff, these positions will vary upon the size of a hotel. Director of sales and marketing. Bigger hotel handles the marketing plan as well as running the sales office. Director of sales, strictly running the sales team most likely. May dabble with the marketing plan, could be that a general manager is handling that, but again, they're definitely overseeing the sales team. Your convention sales manager. Now, typically, these are um, the ones who will handle a booking at a larger property. So, for instance, um, when I worked at the Crown Plaza downtown, as a sales manager, we always like to say that I um, turned it and burned it, if you will. So, in other words, I turned the contract in, I gave it to the convention sales manager, and I was hands off. I was done, and I moved on to the next sale. And the convention sales manager is the one that's actually going to call the client and say, okay, from your contract, I see that you need A, B, C, D, E. And they're going to start working on the particulars. And all the nuts and bolts and all the implementation of those meetings is going to be handled by that customer service manager. Now, smaller hotels don't get that privilege. You have a group, you sign them, you service them, you thank them, you do the whole kit and caboodle. It just depends upon the size of the hotel. So... Um, uh, again, different different sales man different types of sales managers you can have, tour and travel sales managers who are developing groups and charter businesses, putting packages together. Um, again, probably a larger hotel or a hotel that really delves into that market. Could be a destination type location uh, where they're getting a lot of travel groups coming in. Would make perfect sense for have that kind of sales manager. You might have a director of advertising, public relations, again, bigger properties. A lot of times management companies will handle that as well. Again, General Hotels does offer advertising, public relations, and marketing to all of the hotels that we manage. There's a cost associated with that, but a lot of these hotels can't afford a full-time person, so they pay us an hourly rate if, if our um, director of marketing works on things. Typically, um, the, just the your um, oh, good old-fashioned sales manager. Just, you know, any sales manager that's going to sell. Sometimes you might tag on there, senior sales manager, uh, regional sales manager, what have you. But those a sales manager typically is going to be having uh, one certain type of segment, whether that's association, marketing, smurf, transient, what have you. And that's going to be where they're going to focus their attention. And then your clerical support. Like anything else, you've got administrative assistants. You can have executive administrative assistants. You also could have, and I don't see it on the list for here, but um, at the, in, the, in the crown world, we had a group's um, revenue, was she group revenue manager? Kind of a group revenue manager. She actually entered all of our groups into our operating system. So she was kind of the gatekeeper. Again, I would sell it, flip it over to our, our client services manager. There might be a rooming list involved. They would send the rooming list to Dawn, and Dawn would make sure everything got entered with the right rate, with the right codes, and all that kind of good stuff. So again, it just depends upon the size of your hotel as far as how much... Um, how much staff you're going to have. Again, your smaller properties, you're a jack of all trade, you do it all. So bigger properties, you can usually kind of space it out a little bit more. There's so much volume that you can kind of divide and conquer, if you will. So some other things that you're going to see within our world, uh, regional and national sales offices. So for instance, I'm a regional sales manager for General Hotel Corporations. I have 10 properties that I oversee and I assist their sales teams. 
Now, I am not their boss. Um, although we don't like to use the word consultant, I am coming in with the idea of helping them drive sales. I'm holding them accountable for certain goals that we set. I'm helping them when they run into roadblocks. Um, obviously, I'm cheering on their, their successes on down the line. So again, I'm almost like a, a helpful hand, if you will, if you don't want to say consultant. And, and that's kind of my role is to help develop and push and grow revenues. Um, you also have national sales offices, and those usually come from the brand. So you can have global sales managers or national sales managers. They're working at a very, very high level to help develop relationships for their brands. And again, your bigger companies out there, your Nikes, um, Siemens, Rolls Royce, uh, Pepsi, Coke, uh, Kraft Foods, those kind of things, they're going to have a national sales rep for every brand. And when they have needs, no matter what the area is, they send the area to that national sales manager who will filter it down through the brand to the area they're trying to get. It basically keeps um, the brand from, or I'm sorry, it keeps the um, client having to deal with 3,000 different sales managers. Instead, they have a global sales manager and they're going to control the flow of information. So, um, uh, so again, that kind of gives you a general idea of what you're going to see uh, within the hotel structure as far as staffing. And again, like I said, they're, they're always creating new positions uh, every day, especially as we get stronger with social media. I've begun to see a few um, individuals who that's their only focus for the hotel is social media. Again, you'll see different positions develop as the needs arise. So, so when we manage our sales effort, if you will, and we're, and we're kind of putting everything together, you know, what are the kind of things that we need to do as a director of sales, as someone who's overseeing a sales team? What are some basic um, operations, things that we have to do? The book's going to talk about standing operating procedures or SOPs. Vital. How do we do things? You know, for instance, for some of you guys who are familiar with Delphi or Sales Pro, it's kind of where a hotel keeps their database. You know, our standard operating procedure was everything had to happen in Delphi. If it didn't happen in Delphi, it didn't exist. It didn't really happen. Those kind of things need to be set in stone so your sales team is on the same page and everybody's paddling the boat in the same direction, if you will. So your standard operating procedures are absolutely key to keep consistency in the office. Sales meetings. Good sales teams will probably meet at least once a week, if not have daily stand-ups. Hey, here's where I'm at. Here's who I'm going after. Here's where I think I'm going to get. Here's my success story. Here's where I fell a little short. It's an idea for the, sale, for the director of sales to know what everybody's doing, keep tabs on successes, help out where there's maybe a weakness or, or, if, or um, you know, somebody's running into a, a roadblock, if you will. Sales managers can help one another out. Again, that constant communication. Where are we at? Where are we trying to get to? How close we are to our goal are we? Um, assigning account responsibility. That's kind of, again, segmentation. You know, again, you're going to have sports. You're going to have corporate. You're going to have associations. You're going to have Smurf. You're going to have transient. Making sure people know what their markets are, what their responsibilities are within those markets, and then sending them out. And then lastly, as a director of sales, you're always evaluating your sales team. Are they getting it? Are they struggling? Is this the right fit for them? Where are their weaknesses? Where are their strengths? Are we capitalizing on, on their strengths? And are we trying to improve on their weaknesses? So again, we're always looking at our sales team to see, hey, where are we? Where can we get better? Um, you know, Where are we good already? And how can we leverage that? So um, the, I'm going to kind of just skim over this. As far as sales records go and filing system, the book talks about a number of different things. There's a lot of information about non-computer type um, uh, storage and filing systems. I will say this, 99% of the hotels now have some form of electronic database. So when the book talks about account fires and MasterCards and tickler files, understand that uh, most hotels do have a, a CRM system, if you will. Um, again, a database type system where we keep all of our activities, we keep all the account information, um, and again, it's kind of your Bible. Everything happens in there. So, um, so again, that's really, again, that last part, the sales office automation, that's the part you really want to focus on. It's going to talk about some other things. I always consider that kind of the history chapter, uh, when it, or this history part of this chapter when it talks about tickler files and paper and all this kind of stuff. Again, rarely is it used anymore, but understand this. The database systems that you have, we go back to those standing operating procedures that you have to lay down as a director of sales. It is vital that everybody understands what the rules are and how we use those systems. Otherwise, they can become an absolute mess. And when I say rules, I mean, you know, how do we divide up a piece of business? You know, what 
what is an association? What is sports? Good example, NCAA tournament comes to town. Well, that's a sporting event, right? But it's put on by the NCAA. Well, that's the National Collegiate uh, Conference, uh, Conferences Association. Okay, does it go to associations? Does it go to sports? It's a citywide. Does it go to somebody who handles only citywide? These kind of things have to be developed ahead of time. And again, um, part of your standard operating procedures, but then also when we put everything in our system, who's getting into what account, uh, what, you know, again, who's in charge of that account? Because again, we have to have that separated out. So guys, two good chapters that really begin to help you understand the structure um, in the world of convention sales. So again, take, um, take good notes, look closely uh, at, um, again, all the breakdowns and be ready to talk about those uh, again on our first exam coming up here in a couple weeks. All right, any questions you guys know, please, by all means, email me, text me, reach out to me, um, and let me know what is going on, and we'll do our best to help you out. Guys, have a great evening.